Well, good morning again. <laughs> we are starting a new series today, and I know you're going to be really excited about the topic. We're talking about the shadow. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to get you, I promise. <laughs> That's the point of the talk. So this series um, is, uh, we're going to look at three shadows, and then the last week we're going to look at um, three types of consciousness. And so today we're looking at the shadow of anxiety. And uh, tell you how I came upon that. Um, <laughs> this year my white stone is emotional intelligence. I know it's two words, but hey, that's what spirit gave me, so I went with it. And so I started practicing um, emotional intelligence with a really simple practice, which was just to check in periodically throughout the day, whenever I remember, and just to ask myself, how are you feeling? You know, just to get more um, skilled and, and nuanced at, at that kind of more of immediate sense of what the feeling is that's present. It's one of those things, you know, we don't learn it as kids, right? Well, not necessarily. I mean, you may have learned it as children, but it's not like it's part of our curriculum at school or anything in a formal way. And so I know there are many great programs that we have here, like the Connection Practice and Heart Math and and um, compassionate communication, which is a combined, which is what the connection practice is, those two things together, and many other tools and things available to us. So you probably have come into more of this work of becoming more aware of your feelings. But this is what really surprised me, and it happened more than once on a few occasions. The feeling that came up that I was really surprised about was anxiety. I felt anxious. And this really surprises me because I've always been sort of like known as and given back the feedback that I'm like the calm cucumber, you know what I'm saying? The cool is a cucumber idea. You know, that calmness and peace is sort of the gift that people tell me they feel in my presence and sort of what they see as a part of who I am. And so I've kind of taken on that identity um, felt it as true for myself and you know how it is it, that's how we reinforce our egos is by hearing from other people and then kind of getting a sense of, of who we are in this way so this is partly why that that word or that feeling surprised me but then I began to think about what's going on in our world today and sort of the the vibe of the world you know and I think a lot of people maybe are feeling anxious maybe that aren't used to feeling much anxiety, and those who maybe feel anxiety may be feeling a heightened sense of anxiety. Is this a sense that you have, that there's some anxiety running through the world right now? Yeah, so psychologists say that there's a whole new brand of um, anxiety that they've labeled eco-anxiety, that people are worried about the health of the planet, and, uh, and, and very frankly, human existence. Um, and the longevity of that. And so that, of course, brings up some, uh, some anxious feelings because, you know, what more than anything, the idea of life and the preciousness of life and the, and the protection of life makes us feel that way, right? That's really kind of at the root of it. If we follow every anxious or fearful thought, that's where we go, right? To that idea of death, of, of big transition that makes us afraid. So there's lots of other things going on in the world, the artificial intelligence and people worried about the future of jobs and the economy and maybe the, your, your very own job. And this area, you know, the heightened technology that has uh, had an effect on affordable housing, people who are getting priced out, you know, really base things like our, our livelihoods, our, our homes, our, our sense of, of overall well-being is affected. But so now that's the bad news. Now we're moving on to good news from here on out. Okay. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Right. We get enough of that. Yeah. So so the so the work really is to to bring the shadow into the light. Right. So that that was what happened for me when I went. Oh wow. Huh. I'm feeling anxious, and I've been feeling this occasionally. You know when I check in, and so so once we know, once the the secrets out and the thing is put into the light, that's when we can do our work. It's not, if we go into, 
you know, we keep putting our head in the sand or we try to keep retreating to those comfortable places. Well, there's going to be a point where it's like that's that's just that we wake up to the fact that that's just not why we're here. I mean, comfort, yes, we love comfort, but to hide out in our comfort isn't really the call of the divine. You know what I'm saying? Because the call of the divine does have a little bit of an edge to it. And so it's okay to know that there's a little bit of an edge and we can find ways to ease ourselves to the edge and through the edge and into the great abyss that is the essence of who we are and why we are and what we can create together. So the shadow work is really important because it brings the light to these spaces that we wouldn't otherwise know. And so if we are very intentional about this, we can do a lot of great healing and revealing work about what it is that we're all about. So um, there's a little boy named Travis who really, really, really wanted to come to California and go up inside of a lighthouse. This was his great dream. He had always been fascinated by lighthouses. He made pictures of lighthouses from a young age. He, you know, anything he could get his hands on, he built lighthouses, he talked about lighthouses. And his great dream was to go and to have a trip to California and to get to go up in one. And so finally his mom was able to make that so for him. And so they traveled here and they're finally there. They pulled up. They get out of the car, and it happens to be a really windy day. And so the, the waves are crashing, the wind is blowing. He's not that old, maybe, I don't know, eight years old, something like that. And so Travis gets out of the car, but now he's sort of becoming frozen, you know, in place. There's the lighthouse. He's so close to his dream. And yet the winds are pushing him back. You know, the winds are really high and there's that sort of sense of resistance that I have to go into the wind and toward those crashing waves and up those steps into that lighthouse to experience my dream, the thing I've been waiting for the most. And so he tries and he moves toward and into the wind, but every time he sort of gets pushed back, he steps back a little further and goes back to the safety of the car and he says, Mom, I don't think I want to do this. And so it, it takes a little coaching and coaxing, you know? This is what happens for us when the shadow is revealed. And so his mom then names it. And she says, honey, you just tell your anxiety it's okay. And by naming it, she illumines that shadow and that's the first step. So when, once it's illumined, we're kind of sometimes like, oh, you know, there's a little bit of a step back there. There's a little bit of resistance there. A friend of mine told me years ago, this actually comes out of Scientology, that if you hurt yourself, like let's say you stub your toe on something, it's best not to pull back and resist like we might do, like, ouch, and then, you know, this kind of thing, but actually bring the thing that hurts close to the thing that it hit. And I've tried this, and it's amazing. It works. Because there's something about the energy of resistance that makes things more difficult, more painful, and, and, and really um, increases that sense of divide, you know? And so it's this thing that hurt me. I don't want to get close to it, you know? But it's actually this thing that is calling me to make peace with it. And so it's the same for our anxiety, whatever it is that we're anxious about. It's the same for Travis, you know, those strong winds that were there, those crashing waves that he was gonna go nearer to, that was all part of, of, of the, the process of illuminating the shadow and then taking the steps to move through it so that he could have the divine experience he was born to have. And so he did it, slow but sure. He finally got enough gumption to get away from the car. And then, you know, he had to do it on his own. It was, I mean, his mom was there to help him, but he had to do it on his own. She wasn't holding, even holding his hand. And he pushed through that wind and he got to the base of the lighthouse and he looked up to that tall lighthouse and he took his first step. And once he took the first step, he took the next. And you know how it is, once we get going, it's easier. And then he started with great joy running up those steps to the very top where he met the lighthouse keeper who showed him around the lighthouse and then pointed out into the vast ocean of possibility. 
And that's the process that we go through when we illumine the shadows and we move through them to the truth, to that higher perspective, to that place that then can see, oh, there are a vast number of possibilities. And the amazement of the way that the light plays upon the water, and then it wasn't too long after that the lighthouse keeper pointed out to him some blowhole action going on out into the ocean, and he was able to see whales. And so it is for all of us, you know? Whatever it is that's up in your life, whatever it is that's up in the world, whatever it is that's making you say, I wanna pull away and I wanna hide or isolate or go to that comfortable spot, it's not to say that we can't find comfort, but that's not where we wanna dwell. If we're not meant, we're not built to hide out, and these are not times to be hiding out. These are the times that people like you are needed more than ever to do this kind of tough work, to bring the light, bring the, bring the darkness to the light, you know, bring those things into the light, because the divine light is always there. Whatever it is, that sense of unease, that sense of fear, the sense of you know, divisiveness, whatever it is that, that comes up, to be able to say, I'm going to have the courage, like Travis, to move through the winds and to, to move toward that greater beacon of light. Because that is always the truth, you know? I want to tell you another story about uh, Sharif Abdullah tells this story. He is the author of the workbook that we're using in my class toward oneness, the practice of inclusivity. And Sharif actually was with us this week by video. He did a webinar for us. And he told a bunch of great stories, but this is one of the ones that really stuck out in my mind. Uh, so he grew up in Camden, New Jersey. And apparently, he says that Camden, New Jersey is regularly ra rated like one of the worst places to live in the United States, one of the worst school systems, and that he went to the, the number one you know, worst high school that is, always gets you know, worst high school award. <laughs> That's his claim to fame. Uh, to his credit, he went on and became an attorney and lots of other wonderful things that he does in the world. And anyway, he was talking about when he was um, in middle school. And he said that the teachers decided on this wonderful field trip for the kids. You know, all the kids in Camden, New Jersey, a lot of them had not been outside of, of the city. And so this was a big outing and the teachers were really excited for this great gift they were giving the kids. And they loaded them all into the school bus and they drove them out to Pennsylvania Dutch country. Now, if you've been to Pennsylvania Dutch country or anywhere like it, it's just, you know, there were green plains forever and beautiful manicured farms and people in uh, very simple Amish clothing. And, and all you could hear was that the, the buzz of the city had long since faded. And once the bus stopped, all you could hear was that clip clop, you know? That kind of cadence of life. They had come back in time in a way, too. And so they pull in and the teachers are like, hey, everybody, get out of the bus and enjoy this beautiful country. And he said they were kind of frozen in their seats. And he said a third of the kids never even got off the bus. And he said to the teachers, it was like, what are you, you ignorant kids, can't you see? This is like, we brought you into the country. This is fabulous, it's alive, it's a whole new place. And he said, that's exactly the problem. He said it was like they had taken us to the other side of the moon. He said they didn't prepare us. He said it would have taken weeks of preparation. He said we had no space helmets to get out of the bus into this other planet. I don't know what's out there. There are wild animals there. I mean, literally, it was like a whole nother realm. And so Sharif talks about how he sat there for a while and finally got the bravery up to get out of the bus. And he said he started walking around on his own and he came to a tree and he was looking around at stuff and he said, this place is stupid. Because <laughs> he saw this tree, it was a weeping willow tree and the, and the branches were laying in the river, they were laying in the water. He said, who would ever plant a tree right there with its branches laying in the water? You see, he had no frame of reference for the idea that a tree would be anywhere where a man or a woman hadn't planted it. 
the idea that it would just grow somewhere naturally was just so foreign to him it wasn't even an option in his mind. And then he looked across the riverbank and he saw fish scales up on the branch of a tree. Now this is bizarre, right? Now I'm really in another realm. Fish don't jump out of the water that high. And it just, he said he had no frame of reference. It wasn't until years later that he realized probably a bird or an animal had brought that fish up into that tree and had a snack there. <laughs> but you can imagine what it's like, and maybe you've had these experiences, of moving into a completely different realm and to have no preparation for that. And so it's moving through for us where we are now into that unknown that creates those feelings, right? It's that sense of what will happen. And then our minds that like to make up the worst stories possible and then to feed upon them and to share them with one another and to have them go viral and then to <laughs> share them some more, right? And then we wonder why are we feeling anxious. <laughs> but it's just the unknowing, right? That's what we seem to be most afraid of. It's the not being able to see the whole picture. The whole mural is not yet revealed, only a little piece of it. But this is part of the spiritual walk. And so really, the whole thing is about making friends with this, about making friends with the journey, about making friends with the process. What did Travis do? What did Sharif do? You know, they, they may not have said this, but they really breathed through that experience. The breath is a beautiful way of grounding us, of allowing us to begin to feel the presence. I mean, literally to oxygenate our bodies and to you know, move the breath through the body is good for the body. But it's also good for the rest of us and our spirituality because the breath allows us to begin to feel that sense of presence, that sense of all is well. You know, if the breath goes from these little short, uh, rapid places, to more of an elongated, expansive place, we begin to kind of melt into that knowing that everything's going to be OK. You know, can you get there when you're in that moment of anxiety? Maybe not. But, but as it is illuminated and you realize, oh, I'm feeling that, that's step one. And then we begin to breathe into it. And we realize, oh, yeah, it's going to be OK. In this moment, in fact, everything is perfect and fine and whole and well. It's all that future stuff that we make up that creates a lot of the feeling. And so what else can we do but words of truth? You know, words of truth that come forward for us can be reassuring, can be encouraging, can be grounding for us. Now, some of you may be wondering why I have a sling on today. Anybody wondering that? It's a prop. <laughs> I did think after the fact that, hey, this is a great practice. I should have thought of this sooner to put my dominant arm in a sling and just see what happens. <laughs> you learn a lot about yourself in the world when you have a little fall, you know? So what happened was I was hiking and um, I slipped in the mud and landed on my shoulder and broke my humerus bone, which hasn't been really humerus, but I'm still <laughs> looking for the humor. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Man, were you paying attention, right on cue. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. To top it off, throughout the first week, my funny bone kept like radiating and tingling, you know? So it's like that constant reminder. Okay, something is funny here. Something is humorous here. And maybe the message is lighten up, you know? <laughs> but anyway, we can all look at the metaphysics of these things and have a great, f great fun with them. But, but to bring it back to this idea of the anxiety. So, so, so this happens, I fall, I roll in the mud, I lay in the grass, and I'm with my dog, and, um, and so the sun is beginning to set, and I'm about a half an hour from home with a normal clip, you know? And, and so um, I, I was just li lying there, you know, I knew you know, it hurt, and I knew something had happened, I didn't know what, and so it's just, I began to breathe, you know? to breathe through it, and then to bring these words of truth to myself, this reassurance, you know, it's okay. You're gonna be, I mean, I literally was saying this out loud. It's gonna be okay, you're okay. You're okay, it's gonna be all right, you know? And just, and then giving it to the earth, because I was right up against the nice, fertile, green, muddy earth, you know? 
And so I was like, all right, and just I'm gonna give this to the earth. And which strength, which, which felt like it gave me some strength, sense of support, you know? And then, and then, then what do we engage but our faith, our trust? You know, that we really are okay and we have what it takes, we have what it need, what we need to get from wherever we are home. You know, We're always home, aren't we? Always walking home. We're always walking to that place of truth, that place of knowing, that place of remembrance, that place of the divine. We're always in motion. Either we're sitting there, we're set in that, we're centered in that, or, or we've stepped out somehow and we're moving back to it. That's basically the movements of life, and that's it, right? Then we hit home base again, and we reground, and we recenter once again, and then we bring home with us out into the world. I mean, that's it's kind of like a labyrinth walk, you know. That's that's essentially what we're doing over and over again. And so I was, as I mentioned, I was with my dog. I, I had visions of him acting like Lassie, but. <laughs> He didn't exactly. It was past his dinner time, which is all the focus. But he is a cattle dog, and so even by instinct, his instinct is to keep running back and touching base with, with me, with his home, you know? So that was very sweet. So he would run ahead, but then he would run back, and then he'd run ahead, and then he'd run back. And at some point, you know, I figured out how to get the leash on with, with my non-dominant hand, and we were all set to go. That, that was creating a little anxiety for me. We're gonna get to a road where he, you know, I don't want him to cross. But anyway, the point is that all of this is this wonderful opening up of this idea of bringing the, the light to the shadows or bringing the shadow to the light, however you want to do it, to illuminate these places in us, these experiences that we're going to have in life, these times in life. You know how it is when we get a little bit of information, even if it's not what we wanted to hear, it's like, oh, okay, now I know what I'm dealing with. Anybody ever have that experience? A lot of people have that with, with medical stuff. It's like, oh, okay, now at least we know how to go forward. We know some of our options. We know some of the treatments. We know some of the choices we may be able to make. And so it's, it's that kind of knowing, you know, that comes to us. And so these stages can be applied to really anything, you know, anything that we might be illuminating and moving through, any kind of anxious feelings, that to just breathe and then bring words of truth, of reassurance. Find our, our trust and our faith within ourselves, you know, a sense of, because it's based on our experiences. And so we know over and over again, we've had experiences in life that we've moved through, right? Look at all, all of us, we're sitting here, we're Sunday morning, we got up, we got ready, we came to church, and look at all that you've moved through in your lifetime. I mean, if we told the stories in this room of what people have moved through, we couldn't possibly have enough tissues in the world. <laughs> you know, it's true, isn't it? Any one of us could tell a story or two, or three, or four, that would move the entire room. Because we are built for triumph. We are built to move through times of difficulty. We are created to be the very essence of God. And the very essence of God does not get tripped up by things like anxiety. It goes, okay, honey, everything's gonna be all right and then we take another step, and then we take another step. And before you know it, we're looking over a vast sea of possibilities and watching whales play in the sunset. sunset. Or before you know it, we've entered a whole new realm, a greening of a new earth, a place that although it looks unfamiliar, feels really, really beautiful and magical. And guess what? We've got the courage to get off the bus and to get out into it. And we, each step we take by shining a little light on these little, you know, kind of little hiccups in our lives, take another step toward that beautiful, harmonious place that we already live in, that we already know that an absolute truth is right here, right now, but sometimes it just seems like it's a little cloudy or a little stormy. And so we hold to the vision of the truth that we know, and that realm that we create is more beautiful than anything we could have ever imagined. And I know that when we create that together, that we all have the courage to get off the bus and to get into it. 
and we right now all have the courage to take the steps to get there. Isn't that the truth of who we are? Yeah. Divine order. Divine order is at work at all times, and that word, that term can sometimes be used flippantly, but it's not meant to be used flippantly. It's meant to be that sense of knowing that there is a greater plan, that we are a part of that greater plan, that we are integral to that greater plan. And so that final step in the process after we breathe and have words of truth and affirmation and a sense of uh, connecting with our faith and innate trust is that persistent action. You know, that kind, I mean, I moved home, it was slow and it was steady, but I moved home with a persistent action from A to B. And so do we. Over and over again, there is this persistent action. Once we get going, like Travis, once we've gone up the one step to the lighthouse, pretty soon we're running to the light. So whatever it is that's going on in you or in your world or in your relationships, if nothing else, I want you to hear this and really feel it and know it for the truth that it is. It's all going to be. In fact, it already is. We're okay. Everything's okay. There's an oldie but goodie. God is good. When? Oh, man, you started filling it in before the question came. And so you already know it. It's in the cells of your being, that, that idea that God is good, not just sometimes, but all the time. God is good even when we're going through difficult times in our, in our lives, in our relationships, in our world. God is good all the time, all the time. So let it, that be our mantra together and let's speak it together with, with a great sense of feeling and knowing the truth of it. Together? God is good all the time. And so it is. All the time God is good.